Before we dive in, let's recall what we discussed at the start of this series, that history is mainly a series of choices and decisions. Some of those decisions are made in how we honor and remember the past. Other decisions are made in the moment, shaping and forming the past as it happens. And everyone we've discussed so far made choices, choices that literally made history. Some of those choices constrain certain people, like the women in colonial New England we'll learn about today. Other choices had entirely unintended consequences. Think of it this way. Maybe you didn't wake up intending to watch this video. Instead, you only intended to buy a latte. But at the coffee shop, you saw someone studying for the bar exam, which led you to remember you have an exam coming up in colonial American history. And eventually you stumble across moi. Maybe you didn't intend to watch this video when you decided you wanted a latte, yet here you are. The point is, we live in a world of unintended consequences. So without further ado, let's jump into today's topics, Puritans, Pilgrims, and the New England colonies. I'm Dr. Danielle Bainbridge, and this is Study Hall, U.S. History to 1865. The first English settlers to arrive in New England were the Pilgrims. The Pilgrims were radical, and no, not because they listened to heavy metal. The Pilgrims wanted to separate entirely from the Church of England, which they believed was still far too much like the Catholic Church. The Pilgrims also didn't care about anyone following their lead. They just wanted to do their thing and worship as they pleased. So in 1607, the Pilgrims set out for Holland. Yeah, America wasn't exactly the Pilgrims' first choice. But the Pilgrims had a problem a problem parents have been dealing with forever, teen angst. The Pilgrim's kids were more interested in assimilating into Dutch culture than keeping the faith. And let's just say the parents weren't too happy with their kids coming home with wooden clogs. Alongside other complaints about Dutch life, in 1620, the Pilgrims packed their bags and set out for the Americas. They leased out a fairly unknown and unimportant boat called the Mayflower to sail across the Atlantic. While on board the Mayflower, the Pilgrims also drafted the Mayflower Compact. Basically, the 41 signers of the Mayflower Compact agreed to create just and equal laws once they got to America. And while their piety might have been on point, their navigation was not. The Pilgrims were trying to get to the Virginia Company's land, where other English settlers had been for a few years. Instead, the Pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, which, if you take I-95, is about a 10-hour drive or 600 miles from Jamestown, Virginia. Oh, and the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth in December, with few livestock and little food. And as you can imagine, the Christian pilgrims were not too keen on using their Bibles as firewood. But the pilgrims weren't the only English in New England. In 1629, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was chartered by the Puritans. And unlike the pilgrims, the Puritans were okay staying with the Church of England. They just wanted to do things their way. Although they kind of thought everyone else would be better off doing things their way too. Before we go any further, let's make sure we know the difference between the Puritans and the Pilgrims. The Puritans wanted to practice Christianity their own way, but were willing to compromise to some degree as long as they weren't persecuted for their beliefs. The Pilgrims, on the other hand, were separatists. They believed the Church of England was beyond reform and split off from it entirely. The Puritans believed that members of the church should make decisions about leadership and worship rather than a singular archbishop like in the Church of England. Because of this belief, the Puritans actually called themselves Congregationalists, not Puritans. In fact, Puritan was a derogatory word used by their opponents. Anyway, Unlike the Pilgrims, the Puritans wanted all eyes on them. John Winthrop, a Puritan leader of the Massachusetts colony, explained the Puritans should try to build a city on a hill that others would look to as a shining example of worship and organization. The idea was spelled out in his famous sermon, Model of Christian Charity, and argued that as long as the Puritans worked together and cared for one another, giving excesses to the poor and needy, then the Puritans would thrive. If it sounds like Winthrop is advocating early social welfare, that's because it is early social welfare. But it's one thing to talk about building a super cool city on a hill. It's another thing to do it. For starters, you need a hill. But more than that, you need to be prepared. And the Puritans, like the Pilgrims, weren't exactly prepared for life in New England because New England was nothing like Old England. For one, it was much colder and let's face it, while those Puritan and Pilgrim hats are cool, they're totally lacking in earmuffs. And unlike the Chesapeake, which had tobacco, there was no cash crop widely grown in New England, nor was there any gold or silver. But one thing that the Puritans had that those in the Chesapeake colony didn't was a much better male-female ratio. 
Most of the Puritan migrants came over as family units, and those family units did what the good Lord asked, be fruitful and multiply. By 1720, the Massachusetts colony had at least 30,000 more people than the Chesapeake, even though thousands more people immigrated to the Chesapeake region. So yeah, they multiplied. See, always something here for you math fans. In New England, the wealth was spread out much more than in the Chesapeake. There were rich and poor, but unlike the Chesapeake, there was also a group known as the middling sort, what we might now think of as the middle class. Because there was no main cash crop, society also looked a lot different in Massachusetts than other English settlements. For starters, enslaved persons made up much less of the total population. Slavery certainly existed in New England, as did indentured servitude and child labor. But New Englanders also relied on their own labor as well. In New England, church was the center of social life, and often literally the center of town. As such, religious authorities usually had some sort of political influence as well. Because society was so tied to religion, everyone knew each other from church. That allowed people to keep tabs on their neighbors, reinforcing the strict religious moral code. On that note, all of the religious authorities that we're talking about were men. For all their talk of working together and just and equal laws, the New England Pilgrims and Puritans were a strictly patriarchal society. Though they imagined that fathers should be kind but stern leaders, women were forbidden from serving as church ministers and were not allowed to sign a new town's founding charter. Women sought and often found authority even within this model. Some even challenged it, as we'll see in a moment. Because religion was so ingrained in their society, the Puritans and Pilgrims believed literacy was hugely important. This goes back well before Puritans and Pilgrims way back, to the actual Protestant Reformation itself. One of the biggest complaints Protestants had with the Catholic Church was how inaccessible the Bible was to commoners. The Bible and Catholic services were in Latin, not local colloquial languages. As part of the Reformation, the Bible was translated into English and other languages. So the Puritans and pilgrims wanted to make sure as many people as possible were taught to read, mainly so they could participate fully in church services. The task of training children to read fell on women. This meant women were literally teaching their children the religion that would guide their entire social existence. But women were also quickly reminded of their place when they dared challenge religious authority. For instance, Anne Hutchinson. Let's explore her story. Anne Hutchinson was born in England, but sailed to Massachusetts in 1634 with her 11 children. She was a devout Puritan and also worked as a midwife in the colony. She began combining her interests in religion with her connections to women, hosting women in her home for in-depth discussions on the weekly sermons. Over time, more and more people attended her weekly discussions, including men. Soon, Hutchinson's discussions became more critical of the Puritan authorities. She openly challenged the Puritans' teachings and even claimed that God spoke directly to her. To the male religious authorities, Hutchinson's growing popularity was a real threat. She'd taken the logic of Puritanism, which rejected most religious leaders, to its natural conclusion. Why submit to any religious leadership? Massachusetts religious leadership did not like this. They especially didn't like it because they had trouble arguing against it and because Hutchinson was a woman. So in 1637, she was tried for false beliefs, found guilty, and banished from Massachusetts. She eventually settled in New Netherland in 1642. The next year, in 1643, Hutchinson was killed by Native Americans who were fighting with Europeans in New Netherland because of Keefe's War, which we discussed in our lesson on Dutch colonies. The ever-charming John Winthrop called Hutchinson's death divine judgment against someone who dared challenge church authority. And Hutchinson's fate is a prime example of the oppression women faced in colonial New England. They were expected to train the next generation, but only in ways approved by the church. Straying from that job could have dire consequences. Given their increasing population, the New England colonies were always looking to expand. But the New England colonies expanded differently than the Chesapeake. This happened because up in Massachusetts, the colonies granted land to groups of men who wished to form towns, not just wealthy planters. Some newly formed towns established farms. Others, like those north of Boston, built up thriving fishing and trading communities. And you know what they say, the more time you spend catching fish on the dock, the less time you spend in the pew. Because folks in these new towns were spending less time in church, they were often accused of being ungodly. And since God was the basic organizing structure of these towns, being ungodly meant you were being downright treasonous. Not ideal. It's important to remember that when the Puritans and pilgrims arrived in New England, they didn't just waltz ashore some untamed, uninhabited landscape. Quite the contrary. 
Southern New England was home to the Algonquian people. We learned before that the Algonquian weren't a single tribe, but rather a language grouping. The Algonquian tribes that lived in Southern New England included the Mohegan, Pequot, Narragansett, and Massachusetts. Unlike in the Chesapeake colony, the tribes were each divided into their own smaller groups, and there wasn't any sort of chief of chiefs like Powhatan. Then in 1636, war broke out between the Puritans and their allies and the Pequot tribe. The conflict, which lasted two years, was called the Pequot War. In one of the most violent episodes of the war, Puritan soldiers surrounded a Pequot settlement, lit it on fire, and killed anyone who tried escaping the flames. Some Puritans, both in Massachusetts and back in England, were horrified by what they learned of the violence. Their response was not to question the justice of staying in New England, but to try harder to convert indigenous people to Christianity. For the Puritans, church wasn't just something done on Sunday. It was an entire lifestyle. So the Puritans expected the converted natives to live just like them. Some natives, especially those from smaller or less centralized bands, did in fact convert. Others moved to praying towns set up by the colonists for indigenous peoples to practice Christianity. The Puritans, pilgrims, and natives living in New England all lived in a world of choices and decisions. And each of those decisions made New England but they also made history. So the next time you're sipping that latte, just ask yourself, do I have an exam today? Thanks for watching Study Hall U.S. History to 1865, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and wanna keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.